دكتور هنادي I'm really, really sorry for the mess that I'm having today. No problem, no problem. Uh, it's uh, such, a, such a large was, uh, day uh, conference. Uh, Everybody yeah. has uh, other contributions. Thank you so much for all the speaker or representer for the audience to attending and joining and participating, uh, participating in our conference. And we will make a handover for Professor uh, Beverly Anderson to chairing uh, the keynote speaker, Horizon One. Uh, welcome, Professor Anderson, to chairing uh, the keynote speaker, Horizon One. Well, it is a pleasure to chair this session. I am so impressed with the three speakers that are going to be in this session. But I will apologize to them ahead of time. I will keep their introduction short since we're short on time. I don't want to take any time away from them. Exactly. Um, you think Professor Anderson is available in Hoover platform. It's an AI platform. We make our implications of AI by using Hoover uh, platform as an AI, matching all the world the speaker with audience, with social media, with all technology used by other end to end to uh, get benefit from each other and bridging and making a good uh, connections and networking. Go ahead, just introduce their name and title and um, the rest of um, uh, bio, it's available in Hoover. Thank you so and, much, Professor Anderson. Yes, well, our first speaker is Dr. Malcolm Perry and um, his topic is really fantastic. He has uh, started the research center at Surrey and I'm so pleased to have him, and I would like to turn that over to him now. Um, where are you? I'm here. And there you are. And let me unmute myself. <laughs> and let me uh, just the sh share the screen as well. So share screen. And if I just... Uh, So screen two, share screen two, or on screen. Excuse me. Um, you could see a lot of information here. Share screen. Share screen. I'm going to have to turn on first of all the PowerPoint. I apologise for this. I'm not used to it. So if I just go to this, hit that, and share screen two, share. Hopefully you can see and hear what I'm looking at. Can you just confirm that? Yes. Thank you. Well, uh, good day. Uh, and thank you very much for the invitation to talk. It's uh, been a uh, most interesting uh, conversation that I've been listening to so far. Uh, and in fact, on the screen, the, there's a long history uh, and a great deal of value and uh, future potential in the words that uh, uh, fill this title. They deal with moving economic resources from lower to higher productivity. They define, that uh, uh, goes back a long time in uh, French legend. They define interrelationships through an ecosystem, which was originally a biosphere uh, term. And they help users and customers to achieve more for less today, as we've heard. And this potential has started to stimulate a very wide uh, level of interest across the world. Uh, and partly because of AI's uh, computational advantages and the ability of technology behind this to drive innovation. Uh, and it's really helping us to make breakthroughs uh, at the edges of technology. Um, and all of these factors have prompted the academic community at first and then governments and uh, aid agencies as well. Uh, many aid agencies are interested in this technology and the, the broader business community, including entrepreneurs, uh, to take an interesting uh, an increasing level of interest in the relationship across the ecosystem. In fact, more than 50 countries have now published AI strategies, with some more interested in the theoretical aspects of tech, while others uh, focus on implementation and benefits. So certainly in America, there's a great deal of interest in the technology, uh, and in other countries, the, the benefits and how they can be used, which uh, incidentally is the primary concern of the, the report on the AI in, uh, in sub-Saharan Africa. That's where they really see an interest. Uh, 
and in fact, how to use AI in their societies. But in broad terms, they all cover the skills necessary for both knowledge, discovery and transfer, funding and infrastructure, and potential markets and opportunities that deal with the public and private utilization of data. And in talking to colleagues in the sector, we have a, a, an, an AI Institute at the University of Surrey, it's evident uh, that the IP, intellectual property, rests in the data because much of the analytics is already possible using readily available open source systems. So there's a huge amount of effort going into ways of creating proprietary data. Uh, 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 and many people are interested in that. And of course, there's always the thorny question of ethics, inclusion and standards uh, that sit behind this. Uh, 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 and so turning to um, uh, the talent, which is the first component, if you look at job boards today, it's clear that high level talent is in short supply as a response across all countries. Uh, and at an international level, there are a number of initiatives and investments to try to overcome this challenge. And in China, for example, uh, reports indicate there's state-led venture funding to support the development of AI in education at many levels, right down secondary level. In the UK, the National Statistics Office is now training young school leavers to become data scientists to analyze some of its data sets and build access to these as test beds. Uh, uh, so it's a kind of apprenticeship. Uh, and at the heart of this is of, of course the data. And there are programs that are involving uh, joint appointments that connect universities uh, uh, to institutes such as the Alan Turing Institute in the UK, which is a significant number of international links. I'm sure we have some into uh, uh, the, the Gulf uh, community as well. And there are now initiatives in universities working with the private sector to introduce AI specific courses. And in fact, at Imperial College, you can sign up now for a, uh, a privately run course uh, in the university structure on, on this topic. And if you dig more deeply at our, my own university, we have a number of new academic posts that link our AI Institute to other research specialisms in uh, uh, technologies such as satellite technology, tourism, uh, and computer games, uh, because it's very uh, important to build a socio-technical connection to the Institute's uh, research and linking that with our research park and our incubator and accelerator at Surrey. And other connections, uh, including universities, AI research uh, groups to develop um, to, 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 uh, to develop proprietary data sets and gu guide commercial decisions. And there's also a call from aid agencies to extend entrepreneurship training to take advantage of the technologies for beneficial social impact. In terms of funding, in some countries, there are a number of generic tax related policies to support investment in startups. These span the whole spectrum of technologies uh, and include R&D tax credits with cash back for R&D costs for loss making startups. So if you're a startup, you'll get cash back if you can prove that you're spending it on R&D and a number of other strategies, including grants and low cost loans. But the very deep interest in AI has prompted some governments to enhance these deals. This includes co-investing with venture capital, in AI companies to help to fund high cost R&D. And the reports I've read show that in the US, Sequoia Capital is collaborating with the top AI universities to advise high flying AI companies in which they've invested. And in China, the reports indicate that there are uh, there is a national priority. There's venture funding to support the development of AI uh, in education and many other local uh, and many of their local governments have actually uh, taking the lead in this with government funding uh, to help with levelling up and building strong socio-economic foundations. And some of this investment in China dates back to 2012, from what I've read, when some ministries linked up with provinces to drive specific technologies such as the China Speech Valley. 
And coming to the ultimate issue for all entrepreneurs and the foundation of all successful companies, it's about markets. This is where entrepreneurs start their journey by trying to build a product solution fit as a precursor to creating a product market fit. I'm sure you're familiar with these terms through strategizer uh, ideas, but we, we do use them very commonly in our, in our research park. And anyway, after 40 years in the, in, uh, in the business, my experience um, is that most entrepreneurs think up their ideas from close networks with fellow citizens, work colleagues, or previous commercial experience that stimulates entrepreneurial thinking and action, so are based on market pull. Although some do become developed where a business is created around a new technology. The scale of these potential markets are vast. And as you can already know, you can see that in the, the list here. But our experience in our uh, venture uh, capital team uh, and our Angel Funding Club on the Surrey Research Park, very few companies are coming forward with genuine deep understanding uh, and commitment to AI. It's something that is relatively rare, but increasing in number. So at our monthly uh, Surrey 100 Club Angel meetings, there's more of a move uh, and it's an interesting evolution. Uh, so so what, what we're seeing is, uh, uh, a number of these companies being created around this new technology and the scale of the potential markets, as I've said, are vast. Uh, and where these AI-led entrepreneurs are working is in regions of, in a region's economy uh, and have close business links with this. They can influence the penetration of AI into the region's economy. So in a sense, what we hope to see is increased participation through our investment clubs uh, with companies that are then coming into our, our parks across the UK and I guess across uh, all countries where there is this uh, support for entrepreneurship and driving it into the economy. Um, uh, 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 and this context, uh, some universities are helping customers capture data using research tools that can fill in missing gaps in data sources. So in fact, we're doing that in, in our own AI uh, community at Surrey. And this brings us to place, which sits as a cornerstone of uh, uh, entrepreneur ecosystems. In fact, this is of such in interest. Cities are now being ranked, as we've heard earlier, uh, 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 by Startup Genome. Um, and it publishes an annual success rate. Uh, in fact, their metrics are based on performance, funding, connectedness, market research, knowledge and talent although not directly related to AI, but reading their reports, their methods could equally um, apply to an individual technology if the data is there. Performance is about exits and startup valuations by assessing ratios of series A to B and series A to C funding rounds. That shows the projection of growth of companies. Funding measures that include exit rates, uh, ratios to, to, to years of investing. So the shorter the period of investment, um, the higher the ranking, uh, sorry, to exit, from investment to exit, and the number of new investors uh, uh, that are coming forward. And for entrepreneurs, the ease of securing successive funding rounds. So all of these are lessons to be learned in discussing uh, the environments. A market reach is included in the ratio of locally based to international earned uh, GDP, as well as IP related data. Uh, connectedness measures the number of startups running networking events between them. Uh, and for life science, it counts the number of accelerators and incubators, research grants that serve the sector, and R&D anchors such as hospitals, and corporate R&D labs in a location. And talent covers experience of staff in simple languages uh, and programming, so it's language, uh, spoken language, and some aspects of the ranking of universities in the city that are being measured uh, and employee salaries. Uh, 
and it includes knowledge based on the H index for publication and citation rates of academic papers from R&D centres in the catchment area. But there's also that hidden component which covers that part of an entrepreneur's life, which includes domestic and social factors. And I think uh, we heard from Lawrence Kemble uh, 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 in his presentation about uh, Pavian, how important that component is in, in building the kind of community we're talking about. Uh, and going beyond the work of Startup Genome, the Brookings Institute uh, in the US has looked in depth at the type of factors that they see as influencing innovation environments in the United States. Uh, and taking that as a proxy, the, invest, the interest in the uh, environment for AI companies, their view in these locations have to be metro scale with more than 500,000 residents, at least 0.5% Zero point five percent of regional employment has to be in the innovation industry. Some minimum threshold proportions are reached in terms of STEM and R and D spending, associated patent rates, and the number of adults which at least with at least a degree or STEM doctoral degree. Um, however, these suggestions were only proposed in twenty nineteen and remain untried. And I guess that's uh, something that AI might be able to unravel if they could get the data. But this sounds realistic when seen in the context of what has happened in uh, the south of England, as an example, and Silicon Valley, but I know more about the south of England, that combines Oxford, Cambridge, London, many corporates and public R&D centres, all within socially acceptable drive times or connectivity using public transport and networking capabilities. So what I've uh, tried to do is to give an indication of what I see as the kind of environments that are emerging uh, from a practitioner sitting with 40 years of experience in running a science park and working in, in, in a university uh, and across the science park uh, movement in, in the UK and Europe. So thank you very much for the opportunity to, to speak. It's been uh, fascinating preparing the, the presentation um, a, 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 and an education process for me that's added to what I've been doing. So thank you very much, Professor, and, uh, and for the uh, organizers. And thank you for being on time. I appreciate that since we started a bit early. I'm, I mean, a bit late, I was a little concerned, but I appreciate it. Fascinating, fascinating. I'd love to talk to you sometime about this. Our next speaker is Paul Sheedy, and he's going to be talking about the impact of COVID on the commercial real estate sector. And that's a fascinating presentation. I listened to one of his earlier ones that he gave to Smart City, and I'm sure we will all enjoy it. So I'll turn it over to you now. That's great. Thanks, and I, I appreciate this. And, and thank you to your organizers for today as well. It's been a fascinating couple of days uh, listening to the very as aspects of what they've taken forward. Um, I'm actually, I've actually just rushed home. Uh, so talking about COVID, I just rushed home because my son's been sent home with potentially got COVID because all the kids have got COVID. So um, managed to get just to sit here and get my so, um there we go. We'll crack on. So I'm, I'm, I'm taking into account some of the aspects of COVID. Also, really, the, the bigger focus I have today is really talking to you all about uh, COPS26, um, hitting net zero, uh, and, and ESG. I think it's so important now. Look, you know, COP in many cases was a great success. Um, you know, I work around the world. I've got, you know, in Vietnam, South Korea, we did our first buildings in the US very recently. Um, and COP was a great success and for some countries who really took this seriously, like Vietnam, a quite poor country, but really got a, a great uh, a great vision of where it's going to go in the future. And I was really disappointed with where India went. I, I, I felt it was a massive cop out. Setting that spot. Let, let me look too political today. Um, I'll go through and show you what we're going to do to at least have a pretty big substantial um, impact on net zero and how commercial companies are going to look at the way they run the buildings and, and go for it from there. So I, I don't need to tell any of you, it's been a, a quite a incredible 20 months or so now uh, since COVID hit and then spread like wildfire and 
threw our worlds upside down. And I can assure you, um, my own business, um, being in a uh, business that works on the occupancy of buildings, wasn't the greatest show on earth for a while until we <laughs> remastered and redeveloped and, and brought lots of place. So, fun that we're seeing, yeah, and as I say, my advantage is really we work around the world. So, I have offices in China. And we've done, as I mentioned, the first building in, in, in the US and pretty much everywhere else as well. So what's happened is we've seen a change, not only in how buildings have been used, but also the, the mentality of especially millennials who don't see why they should come to the office. Um, now, I think some of us have gray hairs in this, on this, on this uh, call here. And I think if we look back, our early memories, our early progress of our careers is probably working around bosses and working with people and interacting. And I think maybe they're missing that. Um, I think it's got a much bigger impact on your long-term development than maybe they, they, they see right now. But we see this change and we see, for example, my area of London, which is particularly high-rise sector cook, which I heard in a report last week had 8.4% occupancy rates, which is just shocking. London as a whole has got about 20% occupancy rates, but you know we know New York, again, has got horrendous uh, issues there. Back in China, where we're based in Hangzhou, everybody's back in the office and have been for a very long time. Um, so we don't look at the world as being you know, one statistic. We look at it, it it's, it's changing, and I think we'll see a lot of change going forward. The issue is you as a commercial organization or building owner really hasn't got a clue what's actually going to happen next week, next month, or, the, or next year. And therefore, we're going to help with how, how, how we go forward. So it's really no longer a luxury to have the occupancy data on what's happening in your building. You actually really need to know now what is happening today week. And we know that the commercial real estate sector globally is wasting a minimum of 30% of its power. And that's between gas and electricity. We have breakdowns which I'll show you later, later on in this presentation. The sector has anything between 40 and 68% empty buildings. In fact, a lot more, as I just mentioned, in Canary Wharf, which um, is one of the, those those areas which really has focus on bringing people back safely and yet it's a mentality change which has happened major corporates not taking that risk but we've also seen the, an increase in 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 the course of running a business quite frankly because of the of the impact of COVID. now look i don't sit here today telling you i'm going to solve all the world's problems no matter how much i'd love to tell you that and i probably will guinness one night here today is these are the big issues that have been raised by the UN and on the back of that we as a company have focused on the ones that we know we can make an impact on so how we bring innovation to industry how we look at sustainable uh, cities and communities and, br and bring our part of the data into the bigger idea of what a smart city is you know I talk I know Lawrence pretty well he knows he does a little bit I do my little bit we all do a little bit and as we all know Lawrence will say the same you just got to be the best of what you do and do that piece as well as you can and keep innovating, keep pushing those, those boundaries and be part of the ecosystem. Share that data into the bigger, wider solution that's needed there to, for, to make cities really smart. And cities being smart and that is actually about citizens happier, making things work better, making the traffic work a, a, a flowing, a, flowing the right way. Just the little things that make life just feel more, more, more bearable in, in major cities. And again, a big focus, which I'll take on later on, is, is a consumption, in our case, a consumption of, of power inside a building, which will lead to uh, climate action, which will lead, and of course, everything we do, as I mentioned, is in partnership. Everything from how we work with security companies to FM companies, it is all about us being part of this whole linked mesh to deliver the overall goals. But where we come into this big equation is we deliver the intelligence you need not down to blue dot tracking. I want to be very, very clear. We don't track how many times you've taken a toilet break. It's down to the you're doing inside of buildings and by zone, real time occupancy. And what we do is we impact and deliver a return on investment. We're one of these great technology companies that actually make you money. And uh, not only do you, do you do good, but you make money out of it as well. So for your security teams, you can have a smaller security team, but every breach of security that happens, be that Professor Beverly Anderson coming to my office and liking the look of my laptop and walking out with it. Well, I will know that Beverly Anderson has taken my laptop because we can match the asset and the person as she moves into the lift lobby and then the ground floor. We don't have to have the Spanish Inquisition. We know where that laptop's gone. 
I know you never do that. But also for places like co-working and major corporates, it's the reception teams on the ground floor, on each floor of the building. As you get out of the lift lobby, your face, your name, and the interact with you, and working especially, that's led to the highest retention rates where we're actually where we've deployed our solutions. Now, what we did, we didn't, as I mentioned earlier on, you know, I'm an entrepreneur, a bit like Lawrence. Give me a problem, I'll give you a solution. When COVID hit, you know, I was fairly depressed when we turned the last building off at 2 p.m. on the 20th of March. But we then brushed ourselves down and went, right, we've got an issue here. The world's going to change and we got to come up with solutions. And we built a lot of COVID mitigation technology. I very fortunately had just won a major competition in China in November 2019. And we worked incredibly tightly with Hikvision. We started build, looking at the issues of getting people back in buildings. And what we developed was a way of the identifying who's walking in. Before they even get to the act, you lock the whole system down. And then for FM optimization, why clean the toilets every two hours? Why restock the kitchen every two hours? If we can show you clear as day, different floors have different occupancy rates. Let's do it on an hourly basis. So every 200 person hours that are used on a floor, now let's restock the kitchen. Every 150 hours that's used now, let's clean the toilets. We can even break that down into the percentage between male and female. Let's start using intelligence so the FDM teams know what to do, where to go, and why. Now, on the back of all this data, I am going to sound a little too passionate here, but there's a reason behind all this. We use the data for the evacuation of high-rise buildings. And when we have, in the case, 420 firemen die in the Twin Towers. We won't have 67 people die in Grenfell four, five years, four years ago now. We won't have these issues that have happened we've seen in Dubai and elsewhere. We will give to the fire service of Kuwait or Qatar or London or New York or Hangzhou, where I'm based in, in, in China, the data they need to ensure that you have the safest possible way of evacuating a high rise building. And I can assure you things are getting worse, not better. Everybody said after 9-11, things will change. I can guarantee you nothing changed after 9-11. So how do we do all this? You'll be glad to know for once, we're not gonna ask you to download an app, turn on blue, have your uh, Wi-Fi, we don't turn your phone off all day long. We have developed this. And in fact, I want to say, uh, I, although I have never spoken to Professor Parry before, I actually did my very first initial fact-finding report with the University of Surrey. So your first, the first the report I did on, on where we should be heading with this was actually from the University of Surrey. So I do hope we can connect in the future again, because we do want to talk about some satellite technology. So what we do, we put our sensors in the lift lobbies of each floor of a, of a building. We embed inside your access card, and your access card stays exactly, the access system stays as it was. We embed our UHF long-range chip and antenna that allows us to see that card as you walk out of the 39th floor of my, of my, in my building. We see who's been detected. Immediately, the data needed for whoever needs to know that is the that data is amazing reporting tools that really give you what you need to know where and when. And then the important thing is the tools to act immediately. Fire alarm, let's kick off to the building management fire service. Breach of security, let's tell the security teams. Someone's walked onto a floor, let's tell the receptionist who's, who's there. Immediate communication protocols across any mobile device that there is. Now, our solutions go from not just the card solution, but also to people counting systems, which means you count both the members or the, the employees and visitors, but also the ID tech checks as I mentioned to you before. So we have the temperature controls as well as anything else. And this is working on detecting somebody with a full face mask on, which of course face recognition will, will never do. And having the thermal camera at the same point to know Beverly Anderson's walked in. She hasn't got a temperature. Access control is fine. David Gill's walked in. He's hot. Let's go in and close his access control card down. So when he touches it, it won't work. He gets a message say, stating that he's been asked to leave the building because he has a raised temperature. Security and the HR team are immediately notified of the same situation. And boom, you work out where was David Gill the last two or three days? Who else were on those floors? And you just narrow down who you need to inform on, on this. So here is an evacuation of Manchester University. This is sped up, but basically if the point of alarm goes off, we know exactly how many people are on each floor of that building. And important 
if them have got a mobility issue. So you may have, in my case, Mike Chairman, who's the most wonderful man, but he's 72 and he's not going to be chasing down 39 flights of stairs like Usain Bolt. It's going to be an issue. But we know who's got mobility issues. The firefighters on the way to the building know what the situation is and they can see the speed and they can see what's happening as it evacuates, where there is just, where people are not moving, who they are. And again, to really bring this forward, this is where we now move into the AI techniques that are needed to deliver a really smart building. So at that point when the alarm goes off, the fire brigade in London and Limehouse, where we are in Canary Wharf, will be told there is a, an alarm gone off in one Canada Square. It's 48 stories high, it's got four stairs. fire wardens around us at 11 p.m it's the ceos sitting there grinding away so there isn't anybody there to help us we're sitting there you're blind they know exactly who is where now where the artificial where the ai techniques come in is through machine learning through evacuation after evacuation and different types of buildings in different scenarios looking at age groups looking at male to females i mean one of the things in 9 11 a lot of women were walking on the stairs with high heels on and therefore going slow these sort of things become part of the data set you need to know um it's looking at uh things like random forest algorithms so what if i'm based on level 47 well i decide because in my panic i'm going to go to the roof and this happens in every evacuation people start going up the stairways because it's two floors up not 48 stories down we at that point will automate immediate co communications to your mobile phone to say please uh david gill paul sheedy go down you will not be rescued off the top of the building you must proceed down the stairways only in that scenario will we, will we communicate to you otherwise it's get get down and as we as, as i mentioned as we look at each scenario each different type of building that that's out there will be a different story one of the in fact the biggest building that's just gone up in london to my horror and I've no issue with saying this. 64 stories tall, two evacuation stairways, and it takes 13,000 people. Well, let me see the maths on that one. What we're saying is this is not a luxury. This is an absolute necessity. We cannot be putting the firefighters of London or New York or Kuwait in danger unnecessarily. So getting back to the bigger picture here. As I mentioned, we come out of the, of the Ulef lobby, live view, your picture, your name is there the way in which those, those receptors will interact and get to know you and build up that friendship. And you want, it's a bit like Cheers, a bar where we knew your name. It's the same situation. You just feel engaged. We have the instant alerts and COVID. We have the data on the real occupancy per floor, per zone of a building, and then great levels of that, the data to, to dig into. And this data gives you an overview of exactly the duration of hours used in your buildings. So you can compare and contrast all of your buildings the size and number of people and how many hours are actually getting used and again this is where one of our one of our clients literally cut their build the five-story building down to three stories because they knew there's no way they needed five stories and they've sub leased that out based on our data it's looking at the day part it's looking at how you staff up your security teams your fm teams everything based on what really happens looking into each company each individual how they're using various various offices around the world that you, you you may occupy and then looking at visitor management now this is important especially in co-working where oh my god co-working organizations lose so much money by by employers spooking in people as visitors every day when actually they're employees but actually not paying for them um so we get to see all these variations and we help a lot of co-working companies and then the tools as i say to compare and contrast each one of your buildings so what we also do is we bring in environmental data, looking at the CO2, the O2, the, the, all of these variables inside a building. You know, looking at the light, which of course in Kuwait is going to be very different to, to London, but what is the impact on, on a sunny day coming in on the left side, on the west side of the building compared to the east side of the building? Looking at humidity levels inside the building, looking at the CO2 levels, how they rise and fall based on your occupancy levels. And the, and the temperature as well. And what we build in is in the BMS systems, the variables there, what should the variable be? Now, based on that, what we're looking at is the unique, uniqueness is looking at what is my occupancy level in my building? Now, this is two floors of the same building in London. On the left-hand side, you'll see that basically a maximum peak in mid-morning, mid-afternoon of about 50 people. On the floor, two floors above that, it's about 150 people, about 125 people peaking. 
Now, if I want to use this as my average to run my air conditioning to lower my cost, this is the wrong data. It's great data, but it's the wrong data because what you're look, actually looking at is what happens seven days a week. And as you see, for whatever reason, and I, I can't quite understand this mentality, Monday and Friday is a day off in, in, in the UK now. This is consistent across every building we see. Mondays and Fridays, about half the number of people come to work, so it's about, about average. And then Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursdays, you have much higher occupancy rates. So if I decided to go and use my average to run my building, what you'll see very clearly is on a Tuesday on floor two, in fact, I've got a peak of about 100 people in, and yet I'm only countering it for a maximum of 48. On the floor, two floors above that, I got nearly 250 people in on a Thursday, and yet I'm only catering for 120. So you can look at your FM teams, have half the number of FM teams, have half the number of receptionists, turn your air conditioning down to those rates. Now, what we'll be looking at is, if you look at the left-hand side here, at what point, if I've got an office for 400 people, are those last 10 people who are taking up two or three hours of my HVAC really gonna get impacted by me turning it off early. And this is where we can really manipulate right down to minutes where we save you the, 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 the cost of running your systems. So to give you a bit of background, we, we already have clients like Deloitte. So all of Deloitte's, Deloitte's um, uh, customer, uh, staff in the UK, all 25,000 have we, what we built them a triple technology card. And we built for them a great other, which is now a COVID mitigation technology called virtual doors where instead of having a security door, you walk freely through the building, but our sensors know you've walked up the stairs from six to seven, and we punch it into a security system as if it was an actual real touch against the door. So these are sort of clients we have in, in co-working, in Grover and, and, and the rest. So the value proposition really is, it's data-driven, it's real-time data, and it's going to get you to hit your net zero targeting. You'll see where your cost reductions are. Um, so look, uh, thank you for this. I ran the data on Canary Wharf Group, for example, last week because I just released a sustainability report. And in year one, it's complete ROI within about six months if we only save them 10%. Now we're looking at 30% savings on, 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 on the system, in which case we get them to an ROI in about 68 days. And in year two, running the whole system, they've got an ROI each year 40, in 40 days and they'll save 1.8 million in just power in that building on what we deliver to them. So look, thank you. I do plead with you. The world has to change and has to change now, not tomorrow. And Q8 has got a major, has a, a fantastic city with a lot of high rise buildings. And I know because in the summer, people are leaving by about half two, there is going to be a massive amount of, of um, HVAC, especially wasted, energy wasted on that. If you just make a small change, just put that piece of technology in the access card, you'll have the data to know what to do and absolutely nail down your net zero targeting and deliver that data for your ESG reporting, your environmental social governance. This is real data that you can stand up behind and it's- I'm going to have to Thank you so much. You. <laughs> Thank you. I'm right there finished. Thank I you. don't want to take time away from Prof Professor Gill. Uh, uh, for his, that so was much. a fascinating presentation, Paul. I think it's a, I came up with a new term. It's called an automated building is what it really is. Exactly. Not just a smart one. It's a really automated building. And next we have uh, David Gill will be speaking on the incubation, the evolution of the Cambridge ecosystem. And I will turn it over to him. I don't want to take any more of his time. Well, Professor Anderson, thank you very much. I, I hope you can hear me and you can see my screen. Yes. That's great. Well, thank you. And I, I hope that in the next uh, quarter of an hour or so, uh, a lot of what I shall be saying will be complementing the, the history of the Surrey Science Park that Malcolm gave, not least because Malcolm's already given some insight into the extent to which the part of England in which we, we both have lived and worked for quite a while is in some ways a bit like one very large science park. And some of the issues that Paul was talking about, about how we all change our working practices, particularly post-COVID, but COVID was really an accelerator, it wasn't the cause, how they are changing what goes on in Cambridge today. And my starting point is that there are really two Cambridges. There's this one that the tourists come to see, the one that seduced me when I was in my teens and I thought this is where I want to go and study. And it's still there, it's still ancient and medieval and calm and generally magic. 
But the Cambridge of innovation is this Cambridge. This Cambridge has only been around since the 1970s. This is the Cambridge Science Park, uh, the first one in the United Kingdom. I'll talk a, uh, in a moment about how it came to be, but it was almost an accident. And it, it's not at all the rural backwater that the university city looks to be. Just over the road from the Science Park itself is the Innovation Park. This is the part of Cambridge for which I'm responsible. This building in the middle is where my office is and from where I'm speaking to you now. We were built in 1987. So far as I can make out, we were just about the first technology incubator in the United Kingdom. And it was the vision of the then finance director of St. John's College in, in Cambridge at the time. He was a physicist. He spent his sabbatical not doing research in the United States, but visiting science parks. He came back with the realization that a lot of the successful university science parks in America were ones which had an incubator, a building and a set of people that were dedicated to helping first time entrepreneurs, particularly those from a science and research background, get over all the obstacles to setting up a business that you didn't know were there if you'd never done it before. And I, I, I think in many ways we've stayed absolutely uh, on message exactly as we were devised 30, almost 35 years ago. We have grown a bit since then. We are quite big. We are 5,000 square feet of letable space. At a maximum, we'd have tenants, 90 tenants on site. At the moment, post-pandemic, we're not doing too badly. We've got 72. So quite a few did have to leave us, but we still got quite a few. And at least as interestingly, thinking of what Paul's been talking about, of, of, of the evolution of buildings, it's almost as if every five years since we were put up, the park has grown from being some rundown rural agricultural land to being a mini science park with one new building going up every five years. Each of these buildings has got between about 5,000 and 9,000 square meters of letable space. Over the next decade, the plans are quite advanced for our park to double in size and become a lot more modern, a lot more recognizable of the sort of buildings that you were seeing on, on Paul's presentation uh, just now. But let me take a, a step back. Why do people come here in the first place Why, from around the world? It's, it's because of innovation. It's trying to bottle that secret source of what turns um, ideas back into products that improve people's lives, or as one of my colleagues likes putting it, if research turns money into knowledge, how can we turn knowledge back into money? And it's, it's a, a conundrum that I spent a, a large part of my professional life trying to understand. The best I can do to get the message across, I guess, of what I think the answer to that question is, is breaking down some of the numbers at Cambridge itself. And to start with, although I guess it's a, it's a well-known city around the world, it's actually a pretty small place. You know, the total population is just under 130,000. But in the, let's say, 50 years since we've had a science-based uh, economy, since we've actually been uh, an innovation ecosystem, we've generated, I think it's now actually more like $22 billion corporations. And those are a real um, companies, as it were, they're not unicorns. We only count it when it's an exit value or an IPO value. So this tiny city has produced a lot of billion dollar companies, several of which are worth 10 or 20 billion. And it's done on a, a relatively small um, working population, but there are all, all of 130,000 people, there are uh, 5,000 knowledge firms and, and almost half the population, so there are people coming in from other cities round about, are employed in the knowledge intensive sector. Interestingly, when you look at the evolution of what the domain expertise is, probably for the first 30 years of the life of this cluster, it was dominated by information technology and communications. And the cohort effect is such that, that it still accounts for <laughs> nearly 60% of the total. But in the past 20 years, the life science uh, sector has been growing much faster, partly as a result of the pandemic and the realization worldwide of how important uh, bio 
biopharmaceutical sciences are, it wouldn't surprise me if, if we were having this conversation in five or six years' time, the life science and the information technology sectors were actually the same size. <clears throat> so that is, to my mind, a, 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 a strange example of how you can have a relative balance. You can have several deep verticals that exist in parallel to each other, and in many ways uh, help to uh, feed each other. So advances in computing will also help advantage in a drug discovery. On Monday night, I attended a seminar from some speakers from Silicon Valley who were talking about the extent to which quantum computing, which is becoming quite a, quite a big sector in Cambridge itself, is also helping with drug discovery as well. So my own belief is that having a deep domain expertise in several different areas actually produces much greater momentum and greater strength. If that's the, the upside, let me take a step back and talk about how it was almost the case that the Cambridge cluster didn't happen as a centre for science and technology. And in some ways, we can almost see today that history keeps repeating itself. Although the University of Cambridge is, is ancient, it's been around since the early 13th century, hardly anything to do with science, let alone the commercialisation of science, happened until the later 19th century. And it was only in uh, the late 1860s that the first physics laboratory, the Cavendish Laboratory, was founded. It of the university at the time, the honorary head of the university was Prince Albert, the husband of Queen Victoria. He had attended universities in Germany, uh, especially the University of Bonn. And at the time, German universities were leaping ahead in terms of both the teaching and research of science. And in Cambridge, the closest we came to that was teaching mathematics. Otherwise, it was a university that taught Latin, Greek, Hebrew, and trained people for working in the church, working in government, but did not do anything that would be remotely related to science and technology. It took probably the better part of another 100 years before the, the catalyst happened for turning the research that was being undertaken by the university in the interim period into viable commercial companies, it probably wouldn't have happened if it hadn't been for the formation in the 1960s of a private company called Cambridge Consultants, set up by recent science graduates of the university, whose mission was to put the brains of Cambridge at the disposal of the problems of industry. In, in the next few years, our planning restrictions made it almost impossible for technology firms to get the right premises, to recruit people, to find the right housing for them, because Cambridge was designated by government as being not a development area. And it took what was almost a scandal um, in the late 1960s when IBM, then one of the biggest research organizations in the world, wanted to move its European headquarters here. It was turned down because of planning. That caused such a scandal that Cambridge decided to review its, its planning laws, as a result of which the Science Park was created and then the Innovation Centre, to the point where, uh, since then, the momentum has been such that, listed on the right-hand side of the board, I've done my quick and dirty brain dump of all the existing Science Parks, Incubators, Innovation Centres that I could think of. Uh, without even bothering to, as it were, go to the encyclopedia and check them. And on the left-hand side, I've put all the venture capital firms who are either headquartered here or who have a representative office. So headquartered would be Amadeus Capital Partners, a very powerful investor in, in both uh, information technology and life sciences. Headquartered also here would be IQ Capital, and then, for instance, DGF Esprit, the well-known Californian venture firm, has got an office here as well. And alongside them are some extraordinarily powerful angel networks, without whom I doubt many of the startup companies would have been able to get to the stage of being invested in by the venture funds. When I take another step back and say, what is it that, that made Cambridge unusual 
I think it's to do with the fact that there is still, amongst so many entrepreneurs, whether they are directly connected with the university or not, a sense of mission. The university's mission statement is to contribute to society through the pursuit of education, learning and research at the highest level. And so many of the companies I deal with this in, the, in this building have a sense not that they want to be the biggest or the richest, but they have developed something that they think could actually improve the world. And, and that does seem to matter to what motivates them fundamentally. If I give just one example of that, the tech transfer rules in Cambridge are extraordinarily liberal. And I think in that respect, they, they mirror some of the uh, research intensive universities in the United States like Stanford, um, where if you are an academic and you've got some research which can be commercialized, you will be assisted if you want to, you can do your own thing if you want to, and the scale of return that you are allowed to achieve, you know, the commercial benefit you can achieve is extraordinarily generous by European standards. To give one example also of how deep science and academic excellence go hand in hand with commercial achievement, going right back to the 1980s in the laboratory of molecular biology, Cesar Milstein's research group was working on monoclonal antibodies. And Cesar Milstein then in 1984 received a Nobel Prize. His work was continued by Sir Greg Winter, who also received the Nobel Prize in 2018. But Sir Greg Winter was also responsible for setting up a couple of companies, not least Cambridge Antibody Technology, which was acquired by AstraZeneca, and whose drug, Humira, is now, I think, still the biggest selling drug in the world. So you can be a Nobel winning prize uh, scientist and develop a best selling drug. And those two things are not seen as antithetical here. I think the real problem we have in Cambridge is every so often we become very conservative. We start suffering from not in my backyard. We don't have the space to accommodate large growing successful companies. And it's almost as if every year you can see how one of our real success stories has been bought by a big corporation, usually from overseas, um, in the past, often from America, more recently, uh, maybe from, from Japan or, or Germany. Does that matter from a, a policy point of view? I think it's a shame when you can no longer keep the, the controlling mind and the research in one place as well as the commercialization. And to leapfrog to the next stage of development, I think we have to learn a lot of the lessons and implement the lessons that have come across painfully during the COVID period of recognizing that everything is integrated, everything does need to be coordinated. We do need some of the technology that Paul was talking about, but not just for managing the flows of people in building, but managing things like the flows of traffic. We had a, a sort of free pass, if I can call it that, during, during COVID times. I was still coming into the Innovation Center every day as it was legal to do so. And the remarkable thing for me was how little traffic there was. Since things have picked up, uh, it can take me uh, maybe 40 minutes to travel the 20 kilometers into work if I don't leave at seven o'clock in the morning. So Cambridge has got to start thinking in a joined up way. And that goes against the grain of what we do here because everything in Cambridge has been bottom up. There's been no central planning. There's been no strategic plan. There's been very limited intervention from government. And I'm very pleased to be able to say that what is changing now is the university, which up until now has taken a, a hands-off view, has said, well, we're just basically a, a major research institution. We have no role in economic development. The university is beginning to recognize that not only is it the biggest employer around here by a country mile, not only is it the biggest landowner, but it is also the biggest contributor to research. And it is now looking at developing commercialization, science park campuses, both in the life sciences and in the physical sciences. So the, the physical sciences are happening to the west of Cambridge, around the physics lab, around the, the new engineering department. Life sciences are happening around the university teaching hospital. And it will be a massive infrastructure development. It will take all of the next 10 years and then some to do. But the, 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 the shovel's already in the ground. And I think we're going through a strategic shift in Cambridge. So where are we now? What happens next? I would say that finally, we've, we've managed a, a strange 
reverse path from most of the other clusters I've worked with in my life, you know, whether they've been in, in, in Thailand or Israel. We've moved from being bottom up to being top down. Um, I hope we never lose that sense of spontaneity, that sense of originality you get when thousands of people manage to cooperate because they want to rather than because they're told to. But we are now beginning to address those problems of not having enough space for science companies, not having the laboratories, not managing the traffic, not managing the housing. And if I'm still around in 10 years time, I hope Cambridge will be the place where young uh, scientists working for the university will be able to uh, afford to live and bring up a family. The junior members of staff working for tech firms will be able to move here as well, as opposed to saying it's not affordable. And I hope onward and upward, it'll be another 50 years. I probably won't be around to talk to you about that, but I actually believe it will happen. So Professor Anderson, thank you very much for chairing. It's been a pleasure. I'll stop sharing my screen. And um, I hope that wasn't just too much information in 20 minutes. No, but thank it you very was much fascinating. Indeed. I think the recognition that it's all an ecosystem. I've been taking a course studying Newton and for every action, there is a reaction. I was thinking of that when you were talking. In <laughs> right. any ecosystem, you're going to have, anytime you do something, there's going to be another reaction to it. I would really like to thank all three of our speakers. I think the presentations were absolutely fascinating and I learned a lot and I hope all of the other participants learned a lot also. And I'd like to thank Hanadi for putting together this conference. Last year it was great, and I think this year it's even greater. So a big thank you to Hanadi. And at this, I believe it's time that I turn it over to Michael. Yes, Beverly, you turn it over to me, and it's always a pleasure seeing you again, Beverly. Yes. You did a great job, thank you. Okay, so um, let's move on to the next session. Um, there are three papers in the session, so uh, each presenter can have up to uh, 20 minutes. Uh, if you finish a little bit early, we wanna have some discussion, we can certainly do that, but we'll allow 20 minutes for uh, each speaker. Um, as you get close to the mark, I ran into a little trouble yesterday because we had to do everything in 10 minutes, but I think in 20 minutes, we, we, uh, we should be okay. Uh, so if we're ready to proceed, um, Edward Morrison is um, from the US presenting the uh, first paper. Um, I'm assuming Edward is here. Yep. Okay, good. Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, see, uh, can you, you can share your screen okay, I'm assuming. Yes, right? I can, and I will, and I will quickly uh, jump in. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, I will take uh, hopefully less than 20 minutes. Can I start? Fire when ready. Perfect. Uh, I'm going to give you an introduction to ecosystem development using a new strategy discipline that we've been developing called strategic doing, and I'm, I'll explain it. Um, but first, a few introductions about how ecosystems uh, present themselves to us at the Agile Strategy Lab where I work. Um, the first is a, an example from Milwaukee, uh, Wisconsin in the U.S. about how do we build a water cluster. This is Sam White, a professor at the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee, approaching us with this question. A second question, uh, how do we create a startup ecosystem? This is the dean of a regional um, university where I am now at the University of North Alabama. And he's interested in how do we develop an ecosystem that uh, supports startups? Some time ago, a uh, city employee in Charleston, South Carolina approached me about how do I build a new uh, cluster of digital businesses in Charleston, South Carolina. This is a, um, uh, now the provost at the University of Puerto Rico, but that, back then uh, he was a research uh, scientist, a chemical engineer from Caltech, who was at the University of Puerto Rico, Obaldo Cordova, and wondering how uh, Puerto Rico could recover after Hurricane Maria. And we have a last uh, example here is um, uh, from a defense contractor who said, uh, how do we develop uh, condition-based maintenance across the Aegeus destroyer fleet in, in the US? How do, we, how do we create predictive maintenance? Uh, how do we deploy that? Well, all of these situations are complex uh, adaptive systems. They're ecosystems. And so the question is, 
how do we address these challenges? And if we start to think about this, um, Alfred and Head, who are two uh, Australian uh, uh, scholars, have given us a very good way to think about this. Uh, they say, look, wicked problems have two dimensions uh, that we need to be aware of. One is that the, so the uh, problem itself has many different uh, causes. Uh, so the problem is not necessarily clear. The solutions are not necessarily clear. It's not a technical fix. There's not a, uh, a linear process that you can come to a solution on. And then secondarily, as you expand the group of people contributing to solutions uh, across the horizontal axis, you start to see complexity emerging uh, with the collaboration itself. So you have two dimensions of, uh, of complexity, and that's really what strategic doing was designed to address. How do we do complex work in open networks when nobody can tell anybody what to do? That's basically the challenge. So um, if I flip back to the water cluster, within uh, five months of a, uh, a strategic doing workshop that we held in 2008, uh, we started to see an ecosystem forming around four different areas of potential opportunity, environmental, energy efficiency, process and treatment, and monitoring and detection. And that uh, pattern of activity has, in, has uh, continued to expand as the Water Council has become a, uh, a global water club, uh, water hub. So the Freshwater Technology Council, the Freshwater Technology Cluster in Milwaukee has continued to evolve since its launch in 2008. If I flip over to that, uh, the question about how do we develop a complex ecosystem of outside companies to, to develop a solution for a really, challenge, a really big challenge of deploying condition-based maintenance or predictive maintenance across the Aegeus destroyer fleet, we see that we have to bring these companies in in an open innovation framework. We have to develop this, these uh, solutions very quickly in a matter of weeks. And we have to be aware of the power differentials between the companies, that the big companies can dominate the small companies. And the small companies, as a consequence, who often have you know, critical technologies, are not uh, not um, uh, feeling very comfortable. So what uh, what we've done with strategic doing is create a an operating system which we'll go into. But now we're starting to see deployments of strategic doing uh, this new open source uh, approach across uh, the province of Alberta and within uh, platform Calgary. And uh, most recently, we've been working in Ecuador with the, uh, the new Minister of Production and Trade who came to Purdue when I was there to learn about this approach. And now we are working with uh, Julio to spread this discipline across Ecuador. So what, what is this strategic doing and why are we using this? Well, it's in developing ecosystems, we're often confronted with this really big challenge, which is we have a complex set of partners uh, potential partners, but it's very, very confusing. It's just a bunch of loose connected pieces. So what strategic doing does is it enables people to form action-oriented collaborations quickly and move them toward measurable outcomes while making adjustments along the way. So you create a protocol or a, a discipline of building and uh, designing and guiding these collaborations. And it's an open source protocol. In other words, there's no licensing of the tech underlying technology. All you do is you learn how to use it. So um, as we were developing strategic doing, and I'll go through that development path in a minute, uh, we were uh, framed by Deming, who said, you know, you have to define this as a process, because if you don't really understand, if you don't really define it as a clear process, then you don't really know what you're doing. So what we do with strategic doing is we take advantage of the idea of platforms, which is a key part of uh, ecosystem development. We can't design and guide the ecosystem itself uh, because it's a complex adaptive system, but we can design and guide the activities on the platform on which ecosystems form. And this is a critical distinction. This is a critically important point. And so what we are able to do now, and this is an example taken out of Puerto Rico, is we're able to teach these skills across groups of people in a relatively small uh, 
increments of time. In other words, we can deploy strategic doing within a week as we did in uh, Puerto Rico after Maria. And we started focusing on how do we teach these skills? Uh, Ubaldo essentially was the, the, uh, the uh, research scientist who brought us to Puerto Rico and we started spending, uh, ex expanding our frame of people involved in this. So what is, what is strategic doing? How did it develop? Well, I'm, I'm a researcher, practitioner, scholar that uh, started out as a consultant. And this started in Oklahoma City in 1993, confronting with the challenge of how do we diversify out of an oil economy in Oklahoma? Uh, the, the economy had been dead for about 10 years. And the question was, how do we do this? Uh, over a 10 year period, I started working on this challenge of how do we develop a new strategy discipline in, in uh, networks as opposed to hierarchies. I moved to Purdue in 2005 to run test beds. Uh, and those test beds ranged everything from NASA to Flint, uh, Flint um, uh, Michigan, where we dealt with uh, teenage violence to engineering education across 50 universities. Uh, we started building out these test beds. We used uh, partners in Fraunhofer and Lockheed and, uh, and NASA to help us do that. Then we wrote a book. Once we figured out how to teach these skills, we, then we wrote the book. And now we're using this to spread this discipline across, um, across the globe, really. So here's what can happen when you start to teach people how to collaborate. You can start to see an ecosystem actually forming. And this takes time, but you can see it forming as we did in Oklahoma City, we changed the pattern of the way people think, the way people behave, and the way people do work together. This is, these are the critical dimensions of a culture. And so Oklahoma City is now point, pointed to as a, as a leading um, transformation. And this is what drew, uh, of course, this is what drew Alberta, uh, which faces the same kind of transformation right now. We've then moved this back into the academic environment. <clears throat> so after we wrote the book, we, um, we started talking to uh, both practitioners and academicians and scholars about what we were doing. And they started to see, yes, in fact, this is a very viable approach to addressing the challenge of collaboration across networks. And now we are developing uh, it's a cross-cultural model. So we're teaching this now in Dutch and in German. Uh, we're teaching it in Spanish, of course, in, in Ecuador and Puerto Rico. And we're starting to teach it in Chinese in China. Uh, and so one of the aspects of this is that we've started to connect with some remarkable personalities, including Yo-Yo Ma, who wrote the foreword to the book. Uh, if you're interested in the underlying um, research of why this works, I invite you to download my doctoral thesis. Uh, it essentially outlines how strategic doing is formed around uh, two questions of strategy, four questions of a strategic conversation, and then 10 rules. These 10 rules enable us to, uh, to build out a collaboration uh, quite uh, dynamically. So that in essence is my presentation. I hope I didn't take too long. Uh, if you want to take some more steps forward, you can do that quickly with uh, the book, the website, or our Agile Strategy Lab. So I invite you uh, all to participate in, in those. Okay, very good. That uh, you, step, um, you still have plenty of time left over. You, you know, Ed, it, it seems to me that, that um, the idea of rebuilding, as you did in the city of Oklahoma City, um, it just seems like a monumental task. I mean, how could you possibly get all of the different parties to agree on what the direction should be? Everybody sort of knows what the goal is. We want things developed, but I'm sure there's dozens of different roads people wanted to take to exactly how you get there. How did you of ever course. get them to agree? <clears throat> well, it, it, the challenge, of course, is that, um, you know, the largest... Uh, big wicked problems appear very, very large at times, but you start to understand that the transformations take place within teams. Uh, teams are the smallest unit of, of transform transformation. And the conversation within the team is really the smallest unit within the team. And so that's really where strategic doing focuses. It focuses on the notion that uh, 
our conversations, how we design and guide them are critically important. And so what we do is we start to build out from a core team. So it's not a top down or a bottom up model. It's a, it's a network based model that builds out from a core uh, uh, and we design new approaches to thinking and behaving and doing work together, creating new value. And as over time, those networks start to grow and those networks start to, to expand. So for example, um, uh, the Milwaukee Water Council, that was, that was launched in 2008. And so it's now, what, 13 years later, and it's a global water hub. The Charleston Digital Corridor, which is a globally uh, recognized the digital corridor, started with two people, uh, Ernest and myself, in 2001, so 20 years ago. Uh, the, the Oklahoma City transformation took place, uh, started in 1993. Uh, we had a year of the bombing that we had to, to, had to, we suspended activities, but then of course uh, we kept on going. And by 2000, 2001, we started to see real transformation. So these are transformations that take time, but if you relentlessly focus on creating new value through collaboration, and you relentlessly focus on doing, uh, uh, experimenting, running prototypes, what we call Pathfinder projects, continuously running Pathfinder projects, then you create um, a pattern of activity, a pattern of thinking, a pattern of behaving, a pattern of doing work together, which in essence is a new culture. You know? And so many, many of these uh, communities are stuck in an old uh, mindset. They're looking backwards, um, and so if you really look at some of the uh, excitement, uh, exciting transformations that I've been involved with, it starts with a new narrative. It starts with where are we going? How will we get there? Which are the two key points of strategy, two key points of strategy. So it's continuously focusing on those, those uh, doing the doable. Yep. So when you get started with this, um, I imagine you try to get as much public input as possible, what the current residents see. Uh, and also, I, I guess you have to be very transparent as you go through this whole uh, process. I imagine there are some uh, decisions you made that turned out to be not the best and may have to be, uh, had to be modified. Um, mm -hmm. But I would imagine being transparent with everybody all along the way is probably um, the best way to get to the result. Yeah, if you think about uh, the network logic, the network logic drives, uh, these networks are driven off of trust. Trust is what drives the speed of the network. And so transparency becomes absolutely critical to this. Uh, so, so the first rule of strategic doing is essentially creating a safe space. Psychological safety, Amy Edmondson's idea around psychological safety is really critical to building the space within which people are willing to share assets they already have. They, they, they're assets that are already in their networks. They're willing to share those assets. And then in a process of recombinant innovation, where they start to connect these assets in new and different ways, they start creating new opportunities, new value. And that's essentially what collaboration is. It's a, it's a, it's a process of recombinant innovation or of effectual innovation. It's also been called effectual innovation or effectual logic, where we take advantage of what we already have and we start connecting it in new and different ways. So let me give you an example. Uh, yesterday, I was on a call with entrepreneurs in Ecuador, and we had an entrepreneur who is very, very skilled at, um, at Lego Serious Play. And we had another artist entrepreneur who was very, very skilled at, uh, um, at the, the um, application of Ecuadorian culture to, her, to the stories of her art. So the question is, what could you do with, with uh, combining uh, Lego serious play focused on new product development with Ecuadorian culture? And how could we develop new products that were steeped in Ecuadorian culture by just combining the assets of those two people? So this is the, this is the challenge. Leadership now becomes a, a, a function of asking intelligent, focused questions and holding people to account to actually doing things. Excellent. Well, I find this very fascinating and the results you achieved uh, are very impressive. And it looks Thank like you. you're able to apply them 
um, in many different situations, different cities, even in different countries. And I guess the basic principles seem to work and a good way to get things developed. Great job, yep. Ed. Thank you very much for Thank you. presenting the uh, paper. Certainly very valuable. Um, we could speak, I think, much more about this, but I think we've about used up the first 20 minutes. So thanks again. Perfect. Uh, Thank we, you. We uh, mm -hmm. appreciate it. Okay, uh, number two, Giordano. Is Giordano here? He is, he is. He is here, good. All right, and the last name is pronounced Dictor? The last name is pronounced Dictor. That's real correct. Okay, so uh, yesterday I botched a bunch of names, so I feel good. These, these are not too hard. So uh, Giordano's Ooh. from Belgium. Um, and he's got 20 minutes to uh, present his paper and uh, any discussion we have in there, that'd be great. Giordano, please proceed. Great, I'm gonna share my screen as well. Are you able to see it? Yes, yes we are. Great, so thank you very much uh, for to the organizers and thank you very much for organizing this panel. Already the first panelist was, extremely insightful, I, I believe, and it's going to be difficult to, to top that, I think. Uh, but I'll, I'll do my best. Uh, and um, I'm going to correct you, Michael, right away. This is not coming from a paper that, I, that has been wrote. It's coming from 20 years of practice in uh, trying to build up and to um, get um, ecosystem players and enablers to work together in the field and mostly in, uh, in, uh, in, developing, in, in the developing countries. And uh, uh, we've done this for, for, for many years and we have uh, uh, witnessed in the last, uh, uh, especially in the last 10 years, a level of complexity which is becoming uh, quite uh, more and more unmanageable. Therefore, uh, tools such as the one presented before become absolutely important uh, to us uh, to acquire it and, and, to, and, to, uh, and to learn how to use, really, because uh, what was working uh, years ago really uh, doesn't work uh, now. And uh, the complexity is due to different layers of, uh, of, um, of issues that have come and disrupted the markets, especially when we're talking of marketplaces such as uh, ecosystem for entrepreneurship and startup creation. This is what ex exactly what we do. So we go there and uh, in, in, in countries and we help uh, ecosystem players to get together and to design the best entrepreneurship support value chains that are possible uh, in that uh, in that area, giving the specific context where these are uh, where these are based, and uh, trying to not adopt a copy and paste solution, which too often has been uh, has been has been um, has been uh, let's say the uh, the way of doing. Um, therefore, when I when I speak about ecosystems. Um, these are mainly the cause of all my frustrations. Uh, this is uh, the, um, the difficulties that we have when we go, uh, for example, in, uh, in Mongolia, in Western Mongolia, where we did, uh, a, a, um, we put together a group of, uh, of actors in the province of Uvs uh, to talk about how to support the, the, the the local entrepreneurs, which are not the high-tech entrepreneurs that we are accustomed to, are, are different, are, are different tar uh, targets. Uh, and we, uh, we see that uh, a cow herder with five cows wants to double its, uh, its um, stock of cows uh, by intaking a business angel. We start Try we I mean we start crying and saying trying every time there is a there is a there's a there's a there's a fight to make them understand that that is not what they need that is not how to, that's these are examples that do not work uh, so the Silicon Valley example or the or the 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 high tech models and of acceleration models do not work for the vast majority of the territories of the world 
they do work in big metropolitan areas and in, uh, in very advanced uh, regions. But if you go uh, where the vast majority of the population in the world lives, they do not. And they have to build really their own. So it is a marketplace, of course, of this is uh, just a, a timeline which shows how the, the, the things have changed and how uh, many players have come with many different uh, uh, missions and then many different ways of doing uh, until uh, um, several years ago, nobody was talking about uh, co-working spaces, nobody was talking about accelerations, nobody... These are all things that are new that have heavily changed the incubation industry over time. And this is things that, uh, uh, well, luckily they're there, they give more model, they give more, uh, more, 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 uh, more options out there, but uh, the marketplace is becoming seriously crowded. And what we see is that it is a very crowded and competitive and distorted marketplace, especially in developing countries, which uh, where uh, startup ecosystems and are being mainly organized and funded through international donors, international organizations uh, that um, fund specifically the first early stage of the entrepreneur's journey. And so there's a lot of funding there, very little in the growth stage. Uh, where actually then the impact of those uh, companies and those startups that actually manage to get to the launch phase can actually happen, then there's very little attention there. Uh, there are, there's a lot of, uh, of um, uh, organizations out there, and I'm including also corporates, governments, uh, who shape, let's say, policies which are really not based around the needs of the local entrepreneurs, and uh, therefore making this uh, um, extremely complicated issues with a lot of uh, resources that are wasted and a lot of confusion then comes into place when uh, any kind of entrepreneur can, that could be uh, from the high-tech uh, entrepreneur or to the, the single mom, who, you know, women entrepreneur or the young entrepreneur that needs a little help, really doesn't know where to go and, and how to get that support. We have seen uh, examples in Lebanon not long ago. Last week I was in Lebanon and there was um, an entrepreneur that was being coached by four different organizations at the same time because the, he got four different grants from di four different pro programs that were attached by a, that, that were requiring him to follow coaching. And he was confused because one, one coach was saying one thing, the other coach was saying another. So we're out there trying to, to help these guys uh, to do something that really makes sense. Uh, again, it's about people uh, until, uh, I mean, where we can find entrepreneurs and, and who can become entrepreneur, the, the concept has changed a lot over time. The European Commission has been pushing and putting a lot of money for uh, women, um, you know, women entrepreneurship, student entrepreneurship, young entrepreneurship, silver entrepreneurship, all that. Before that was not the case, uh, but still the ecosystems, as we see it, are still pretty much geared towards the traditional white male entrepreneur, uh, and they're still flawed towards that that um, that stereotype. Therefore, um, the question here is, uh, um, what can we do to make these uh, uh, incubators that run uh, very good programs to make them even better so that the characteristics of all these different entrepreneurs are actually taken into, um, into account uh, when delivering the program, knowing that if an ecosystem is flawed, it's gonna, as, as the speaker before me said, it's gonna take a long time for it to change its mindset. Whereas these people need really uh, support in the short term. So how is that going to happen? Uh, this is the big question that I think we, we all need to uh, we'll need to respond for uh, to to answer to the diversity really of of uh, of uh, the let's say the plethora and the diversity of um, typologies of entrepreneurs that we're trying to 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 get and each one has its own characteristics, its own flaws, its own its own challenges. So um, as I say, it's a very complex situation. 
complexity of tools, methods, although we see that in the years uh, that we've seen uh, over the years and in the last 20 years, I mean, the mission doesn't change. The mission overall is still there. It, it's, it's, it's the same. It's to engage, to do a full outreach, stimulate people to get there and to try to start the entrepreneur's journey, get them to try to start. And we all know that the statistics here are very poor. One out of 10 will manage, of those who have an idea, will manage actually to launch and at the end to, to scale. So making this in a coherent approach is extremely different, difficult and really um, frustrating to, to an extent because there is, uh, uh, we see uh, ecosystems which really are geared to other types of, uh, of, uh, of players and do not really intake the entrepreneurs at the center of these uh, this field so this is uh, this is what is really fr uh, frustrating i'm going to skip a few slides because i don't want to go there but i want to go into this one mainly uh what we do when we go into um ecosystems building um we have a very very practical approach when we go into a region and a territory and a province and we manage uh, to get all the players together in, in a room. Uh, the work to be done is to really transform this from an ego system to an ecosystem. So where actually players understand how uh, these have to, these, they have to really work together for the benefit of the entrepreneur. Now, this means that very often, instead of being uh, ecosystem developers or, or designing the, 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 the good entrepreneurship support program for the, for the region, what we happen to do in the first days is really managing local conflicts, is really uh, having those uh, diplomatic skills that can uh, put, uh, put people together, find a purpose. And this is done specifically when well, when our technique is very simple. We put them in a room, we, we, we close the door and we throw the key. And then for like three days, we are talking about, about things. So this is a, a it's very, very simple technique in terms of, 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 um, of work to be done. Then of course, when, when you're in that room, it's about managing a lot of conflicts about understanding what everybody wants, how, how everybody can contribute, everybody with their own specificities. Uh, universities uh, have one role, uh, we know, uh, which we think is more about creating the mindset more than creating entrepreneurs. Uh, policies are created by, by the local and, and by public sector. Um, corporates have to be there for their role in, in, in opening up their, their, uh, their connections in their world. We need the business support organizations as well, who are actually those who are delivering uh, the process per se. So uh, when I say uh, it is about frustration, it is about really the fact that um, it brings to the uh, incapacity to take right decisions in, a, in an organized way where everybody in there has a say and has has and sees mainly the, uh, the, main, uh, the main goal out there. And this is not happening. Very often this is, too, too often this is not happening. Um, so the two crucial questions that I think I have and the things that we, we need to be researching right now uh, as, a, as a group of, uh, of experts right here uh, would be one, really uh, understanding uh, how the empowerment of uh, regional uh, ecosystems can be done in a way which really favors those local entrepreneurs without taking into account the super sexy stories that are coming out of Silicon Valley or that are coming out of the latest tech accelerators, <clears throat> which are mainly, I think, ruining much of uh, our capacities to deliver. The second one, uh, the second question is uh, more about social issues right now, I think, since uh, in the last four or five years, we are uh, asking entrepreneurs 
uh, not only to uh, build a company and um, be profitable, create jobs, contribute to local economic development. We're also especially asking them to solve the world problems which were, uh, which are due to market failures and to government failures mainly, mainly. So ideally, how much can we push that? How much can we burden? Uh, the, the young people that will be the entrepreneurs of tomorrow to really uh, undertake this the, and put on their shoulder this other layer of, uh, of, of, uh, of requests that the, 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 the societies are giving them uh, without being too unfair to them. This is a, a question that I would have and I think would need research. For the rest, uh, uh, I think this is more or less what I wanted to say. I didn't really go through, through all the PowerPoints, but that doesn't matter because the talk took me astray. Very good, very good, Giordano. I, I'm sure everybody got a, a lot out of that. You know, if I could, um, we have a few minutes here and anybody's welcome to comment. So let me just uh, start it off. Um, one of your slides you had uh, were the engage and then start and then scale. Um, um, we, we know that uh, the majority of new businesses fail within the first three or four or five years, depending on a number of things. The ones that succeed, I have trouble getting the successful entrepreneurs to think big. They, they've made it here with what they have. And I tell them, look, you really need that. This is working. You need to scale this up into something big. I have a little uh, difficult time with some of the entrepreneurs I understand. I think big. I understand, but I uh, I strongly think it's about the uh, ambition level of the entrepreneur. Now, uh, what we do when we coach and when we and when we uh, work directly to a startup is firstly understand what their ambitions. So where do we, where do they want to go for that? Do they want to be uh, making a good living for them and their offspring and their and their families and the like, and therefore having us size a uh, decently sized uh, startup there and, and company that can work without having to grow it to the, to the next level which will probably take them off rail and uh, and not be able for them to do or do they want to be filthy rich make a big exit and <laughs> so it's really about the ambitions and the ambitions at the beginning so where you don't see uh, usually the this uh, capacity or this of, of thinking big is usually because there's not the will of thinking big. And there's not that yeah. ambition. And I, th I think it needs to be respected. I agree. I, I refer to some of those people as what I call lifestyle entrepreneurs. You know, they, they don't want right. to have the big exit strategy and going public. Right. They just want a nice lifestyle that they can pass on to their heirs. And exactly. their heirs. So, um, and they grow, they, grow. Uh, they grow organically until they reach the right dimension for them. And then it's a matter of keeping the market shares that they have in the local context where they work. And that's fine. So we don't need, again, uh, how much should we ask to these entrepreneurs? Should do the, this is the, 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 the question that I made. I mean, this is, uh, as an ecosystem players, we're putting too much pressure, I think way too much for it. and it's growing every day it's growing the pressure that we ask from them yeah. um another issue i found uh you mentioned about ego um i found really an entrepreneur sort of has to have a, a big ego uh, if you're going to make it through yeah. this yet it turns out to be a detriment later on uh, so I find no, that's a little. It has to no. have a big ego, but when I'm talking of, of ego, is mostly about the ego, the ecosystem players that are uh, there to support him, not about the entrepreneur. I wasn't I wasn't talking okay. about the entrepreneur. I was talking. It's very specific. Very, very often, you go into regions and you think I don't know. You find the chamber of commerce or you find the university. You think they can do it all alone. Right. That they are the king of the place. So that's the kind of ego that has to be dismantled. Okay. And uh, one last thing I, I saw, you were talking about market failures and government failures yeah. and how <clears throat> that oftentimes presents <clears throat> opportunities for entrepreneurs. The market failures, I think you can sort of deal with. The government failures are very difficult uh, for people to, yeah. to deal with. 
that that's what we were asking our social entrepreneurs to do. Um, I, I was in, uh, I'm in Tunisia now uh, on a mission. I came back from, uh, I was drawing for Turkey in, in Lebanon now. And I found several social entrepreneurs that were actually building a company. One of them specifically is collecting organic waste from uh, the, the municipalities and transforming that into fertilizers. Locally produced fertilizers so that the farmers can buy locally produced fertilizer at a third of the price from the imported ones. And uh, this is a kind of, uh, of uh, uh, entrepreneurs and, uh, and, and business that has actually started from the government failure of actually being able to, to manage the waste yeah. of their things. So uh, at a certain point, it is not only about market failures, and of course the government should be there to support market failures, but very often government fails. And now it's the social entrepreneur, the one that has a social commitment towards the environment and the like, that is, that is uh, we are requesting him to, to to uh, to um, to fix the government fail. Now, Very how fair is that? I don't know. <laughs> that's, my, that's my big question. Very good. Well, that was certainly very uh, informative, uh, Giordano. I have an extra minute or two if anybody listening has a comment. Okay, hearing none. Um, how about if we proceed to the last paper? We've got a little more than 20 minutes, so plenty of room uh, for uh, discussion afterwards. So this is from John Wilson, uh, John Williams, sorry, um, and he's with the uh, U.S. Small Business Administration. John? Thank you. So uh, let me try to share my screen there. Got is it. that uh, giving you, you my it. presentation full screen? or Perfect. Perfect. Okay, great. So yes, uh, I'm John Williams. I work uh, at the Small Business Administration. I oversee the programs evolved around um, supporting high-tech small businesses um, and specifically do policy oversight for the SBIR and the STTR programs, which in the US are our largest early stage funding sources at about 4 billion uh, a year. And so we're gonna give a little insight on that, but really a big focus of what we do is, is work to build that ecosystem, that support network. And we're really trying to focus on how to do that in a way that makes sure that everyone's involved. And so again, um, we've moved a little bit and I actually the, the, the positive of COVID has been, we've gotten much more used to virtual meetings and engaging with others that don't necessarily live nearby, but we certainly wanna move away from economies in just certain areas, um, in just certain types of people, in certain types of, um, you know, women and men. Um, so we're really trying to move away to do that. So a little, I was asked a little bit about SBIR. Some may know a bit about it, but, you know, again, it was started in 1982 in the U.S. And the prime reason was the U.S. government was pushing most of their funding because it was easier to our large R&D organizations, our laboratories, our large universities, our large companies. And so we were missing out on that, uh, entrepreneurial innovative spirit. And again, this program is focused really on late stage. It's not focused on late stage um, R&D. This is cutting edge, early stage research um, that often takes a long time that, that is, requires patient capital. And so the program was designed back then and really a focus of the program. And I've, I've seen others from other nations. Um, and I think one of the big things that we have done well is we really do expect failure. We're expecting cutting edge um, to fund cutting edge work. But then the way we phase it is, you know, plant a lot of seeds, try a lot of things, give exposure and, and opportunities to a lot of individuals. And then as that um, either fails or proves out, but fail fast and then either pivot or, you know, when things work, then put more money into it. So it's a stage program that we have. Uh, wait, I'm not. I thought I was uh, working down my slides. Are my slides moving for you? No. Okay. Let me actually, I think because I'm on the wrong screen. Okay. No. Great. All right. Now they're working, right? Now. There you go. Yes. All right. So that was the one I just gave. Sorry about that. My um, screens are not working in, in sync. Um, so this is what we've done. And then this is the phasing of the program. So again, 
what we've actually learned a lot recently is, is putting a lot more of the resources towards phase zero. And what we mean by that is just preparing the entrepreneur to be able to present a successful proposal. But it's not just about that. It's really about preparing that entrepreneur to figure out, is this the right path for them? Is this technology going to move to the markets that they think? Some of you may have heard of the National Science Foundation's i program, but again, go out and talk to your customers before you put a lot of money into the R&D. Understand what their needs are, what their desires are, and often we'll find that what was originally envisioned by that entrepreneur is not really the market that's as strong or the one he should go for or she should go for. And so we want to do, we want to put more resources and more effort there. And that's something we've been doing more and more of, and, and that is an area for sure we're going to be growing. But then what's important is, you know, phase these things out, provide smaller increments of funding early on, test out ideas, and then move those forward. So what we're looking for, again, in, in what we fund under SBNR and STTR is really that it is a significant technical R&D issue that they are overcoming, that they have a unique um, innovation that they are putting forward. And so we're going to look at that. We're going to measure that, that it is state of the art. Um, we want to also make sure that the company is, as we heard a little bit earlier, is an entrepreneur wanting to just do R&D and that's where they're comfortable at or they're really interested in commercializing this technology. And again, that's different skill sets that sometimes requires teaming, um, but that's what we're looking for. And we wanna see signs of that in the proposal. Um, and so to do that, they really need to have an understanding of the market and the customer. Um, and if they don't have that, we're really not interested. That's what our universities do. They fund the research side. We're not interested in doing more of that. We're really interested in taking that basic research and being able to find entrepreneurs, individuals that will move that forward into a market um, with customers. So we have, you know, lots of really big successes with SBIR. It's been around since 82. All these companies listed here, their pretty much first money coming in was from SBIR. Um, what I think, so it's created millions of very high paying jobs, stimulated the economy in all the areas around these companies. Um, and so we've got studies on the return on investment. They're anywhere from 20 to 30 to one, uh, depending on the uh, 20 to one is more the Department of Defense. So the applications are often targeted towards the defense, which is a smaller market, but sometimes, and we, we hope that they spin out into the private sector, but, but the ones that are really big wins are the uh, Health and Human Services, National Science Foundation. Those have a uh, very large return on investment. They're all important. Um, and an interesting study we saw the other day of the Forbes, 15 top US biotech firms, 11 of them had SBI awards. And again, this is usually early in their development. So it's great that it creates um, large companies, but we really also believe that it's important to have mid-sized companies. Um, and so a lot of our companies develop technologies that allow them to be very successful in a niche area that on that area, on that topic area, they can compete with anybody out there, the biggest and the best that they can compete with. And so that's an important um, area in technology to develop. What's unique about the SBR is it's non-dilutive. So no equity is taken into the company. Um, the company maintains the rights to the data. So the government's not allowed to share that intellectual property like we normally would and push for our researchers at universities. Um, and again, we're looking to fund areas that aren't traditionally funded by VCs. Um, so we're not internet of things, we're not doing apps. We're looking at more long-term patient capital, a lot of material work that takes a while to mature that typically right now other, others aren't investing in it. We're looking to invest in those things to a level where others then will come in. So just some examples of some of what our companies look like. And again, we really, one of the unique things with our program is it is tied in very much with the agencies of the, of the US government. So the Department of Energy, the National Science Foundation, Department of Defense, Homeland Security, they all have different needs. And so we're still using their funding. And again, that's one thing that really made the program work. It's not an appropriation by one group, or it's basically saying you as an agency in the Department of Defense or at the National Institutes of Health are focused in doing research in certain areas. We're gonna make sure that you carve out a portion of that to just fund small businesses and, and make, 
take the extra work to do that. And so uh, Ubiquitous has uh, developed some pretty uh, impressive technology at, out of MIT. It's a screen that uh, actually acts as a solar sam um, um, cell. And so now you, you, a normal Windows will actually be a, fuel, a solar cell also. Um, this company here started with, you know, kind of taking really traditional unmanned boats and um, being able to do things for the military. Um, so reducing the risk uh, and then move that into, you know, working on hurricanes, border patrol, and actually they've sold this all over the world. Um, and a lot of it was also um, policing, I mean, I'm sorry, um, coast guards and also uh, um, protecting the beaches and, and being able to rescue individuals. So we have a lot of companies that spin things out and we think that's very valuable too. And when again, we have unicorns. And so Ginkgo uh, Bioworks got a, a couple fundings from different groups. Again, um, a lot in the material side. So they do uh, genetic work. Um, this group, uh, Nanotechnologies, Scylla is, is focused on technologies that are going into batteries. And so obviously, you know, making denser batteries um, with enhanced uh, materials is, is a big push. And again, got their start with SBR. They weren't able to get money from a lot of these groups with venture other sources, or what we've seen in some where they're able to get some venture funding, but that was in a lower risk area. And so they've supplemented it with SBR, which then combined with having investment to help them scale was an investment in some of the high risk stuff. And then combined, we had some really successful companies. And that's what happened to 23andMe. And many know that that's a very successful company now that just five years ago was getting SBR investment because um, to do some of the more um, aggressive things for them. So again, yeah, lots of examples. That's not what we're here for. Um, but I think what's important is the way the U.S. is, is organized this is we do have a central group uh, where it's my office. Um, I used to work at the Navy running the SBIR program and the Navy's tech transfer program. Um, and so what I wanted to do more at SBA is we don't have research dollars. So a portion of our, we, we have no dollars to put towards this program. But what we've been asked to do is really to develop that policy. Our role at SBA is really to help the entrepreneur, help them understand what kind of government programs are out there help them apply for those programs successfully, and then work with them along the way to help them start and grow. And so we oversee policy that is attractive to all different types. So we're really focused on an inclusive group to bring in. We wanna make sure from a geographic standpoint, um, from a minority standpoint, um, um, men and women standpoint, we are funding and giving opportunities to all. Uh, and that's a challenge in the US and we're really looking to change those numbers. But we provide that training, the outreach, monitor things. But again, this last part about building the support network is something that before I came to SBA five years ago was something we weren't really doing that much of. And that's really what we are now providing most of our efforts on. In fact, I just jumped off a three-day event. We have virtually the 25 hours a day. Um, I introduced um, Victor Wang from the uh, developed a lot of, of these efforts and Steve Case was on before that. So we're doing a lot of things to try to train that ecosystem and the tools to make sure that we have an inclusive um, support network. And again, for the tech side. So SBA always focused on helping Main Street companies, um, companies that were, you know, you're more traditional um, and, and were not long-term R&D. And it's a very different support network that you need to fund the, the, the person that's gonna need patient capital that's in the tech space. And so that's what we're working in my office to build. So uh, I think one of the things that's important is we, oh, I keep moving my slides. I'm sorry about that. Um, okay, the role. So I think, you know, it's always important to understand where innovation comes from and what the roles of those different offices are and what motivates them. And, and um, so universities in the U.S. are excellent, and again, across the world, are an excellent source of that basic research. Um, individuals have time to focus on these things. They have the facilities. Um, and so it's a great place to really develop and advance technologies uh, and science. And so in the U.S., though, they are not allowed to then mature that technology and commercialize it. So again, the focus is what is developed and paid for is often then publicized and so is shared with everyone. 
So then there's that step where, okay, you know, where does that entrepreneur come in to actually mature? And so you could license to a large company or an entrepreneur. We also have a, a big source of federal labs. And those federal labs, again, ideal, they do basic and applied research, but it's for a targeted area. Um, often these are defense, but also in the Department of Energy. And they're not designed, they're not allowed legally to compete with the private sector. So they can do some things very well. They have some of the best scientists in the world at these places, and which is a great resource for us because they are the ones that often vet our proposals coming in to make sure that these are state of the art, that these ideas haven't been tried before and proven wrong, but that actually there's something there. And so from a technology standpoint, to have some of the best scientists in the world reviewing those things is critical. Um, and we also have a lot of large tech businesses, but they're driven by stock prices. They are, um, if they mature to technology and they've been developing that for years and they've invested millions and billions of dollars in that, they want that line to stay. They don't want to go to the next version. They don't want to take something that would potentially push out their old technology. So while they're a great source for technology and buying and getting large uh, manufacturing of things, they don't often have the innovation focus um, because it's, it's often driven by the stock market. So really in the US, this group of tech small business entrepreneurs is key to us to be able to be the ones that are motivated to develop something that's disruptive, to develop something that you know, takes what has been done in the labs and moves it into products and services. And then depending on how they, they strategize, it could be that they license, it could be that they build their own companies as some of the large companies I showed you, but lots of options, but that's the group that's really important. And so again, we wanna provide them the tools to make applying for federal funding, to make getting access to private investment, because again, we see our role as federal funding just gets them to a point, but we wanna to start to make sure we're also getting access to private funds and investors. And so making them invest, those investors aware of what's being funded in a cost-effective way is all important and things that we try to do. So reasons why the program has been successful, in my opinion, is that, you know, again, I've talked about, we have a really strong technical review of the proposal. So, you know, the best in health, the best in energy, the best in materials are looking at these, tech, these proposals as they come through and they're making an assessment on that technology. But we also then bring in a business side. Now, this is an area I'm gonna talk about later that we still don't do well enough. Some of our agencies, like the National Science Foundation does that very well. They actually bring in outside experts with really our businessing, marketing, um, venture capital types that really understand how to mature technology and what the market is. But that's something that we are, we do and we measure on all of our proposals. How strong is the technology? How much of a market is there? Will it transition? What's the potential of that if it is successful? So those um, evaluation teams are really important because um, you really want to fund the right ideas and invest in that. Um, you want to be biased to who the inventor is, where that, where that individual lives, what that individual looks like. You just want to focus on the science and then you want to try to figure out, do they have a business um, side of things? And if they don't, we found that we can start to build that for them. The science is often a hard thing to get, but we want to make sure ideally that it has both. And so again, we're funding things that are not next generation, I mean, that are next generation technologies and not just incremental improvements. And that is important. And I've talked about this, that this ecosystem support organization. So building that network where individuals can find mentors, they can find entrepreneurs and residents, they can find access to capital, um, they can find access to facilities. You know, we have a lot of facilities at our federal labs, it's very hard for, and even at our universities for an individual from outside to come in and be able to use. And so we're trying to break down those barriers by creating standard agreements where those things are easy. And so we make the most of, of the equipment they need to advance their technology that they would not have normally. So, um, and again, these, uh, you know, the, the part about this being a legislative requirement is, is key in making this program long-term. So it's been around for 40 years and, and that helps that people know the program is going to be there. But again, we constantly have to get the word out on it. So moving forward, um, we are really focused on building a stronger expertise on the commercialization side, on understanding and providing training to help that individual commercialize. 
Um, we need to reduce the time that it takes from a proposal to come in to the time we've made a selection and started to provide money to them. Government in the U.S. government contracting and processing is, is labor intensive, um, and we're really trying to move away from that and come up with different ways where especially in the early stage monies, the smaller amounts of money, we can do that in a much quicker environment um, that it makes both sides feel comfortable. Um, so continue that focus on R&D projects that require that more longer term patient is really critical. Um, there is sometimes a push to move away from that. And we, and we think that's where our big successes have come from and probably even more gates. Um, fund things as they grow, but make sure that there's enough funding so we kind of avoid what, you know, they talk about the valley of death and that we're working with the private side so that together we're investing together for a while. Um, well, so, you know, typically just federal together and then just private and so that that company can mature and grow. And, and again, that customer discovery and, and doing those things early, providing that expertise, those resources. We really think our grad and postdoc students are, are a great resource and we need to make sure that we we're gonna to try to get them to start their companies at a time where they're more comfortable with not making a, having a big salary. So we think that's a big market is to make sure that they're comfortable with starting a new company and they have the resources to do that and take that risk. But we also know that there's a lot of entrepreneurs that have been successful that we wanna to get to start their own companies that have maybe not been an entrepreneur, but have been in a big business uh, and are, and are you know, very bright and wanna start over again. So we're looking to be able to have programs that do that also. So um, I think, yeah, I've got just one more. Um, so again, we're commercialization is important, helping them do all those kind of things. We're funding more incubators, more accelerators, working with the universities to get them to kind of help the tech startup. That's where a lot of these folks come from. Make sure we're doing private public partnerships. Those are all key things to really making the program even more successful. And this is some contact information. So with that, I'll turn it back. Excellent, John. Um, I had a few questions and things, but I think we're just about out of time. So yeah. um, that was very, very interesting and it, it expanded my knowledge. I thought the SBA primarily made loans, but um, and I guess they, they still do, but this they other still do uh, a lot SBIR, of that, yes. SBIR is an um, interesting thing. And I think- Excuse uh, me, Professor you know, Mike? Yes. Yes, just I want to say thank you for John before he leaving. I know all the time, John, it's busy. Thank you so much, John, to joining us and to be a value added you and the rest of the speaker. Thank you so much. Presenting SPA, uh, the largest uh, uh, administrations in the US. So yeah, I'm okay, glad we'll to help reach out to my email and I'll be glad to follow up with questions and-, and um, Thank you so much. Thank, thank, thank you, John. You. Okay, we're ready to move on to the next session, uh, Hanadi. Uh, Alia, I think, is in charge. Uh, no, uh, the next, oh. uh, it's uh, Larry, uh, Lawrence oh, Molinar. Sorry. He is available there because Alia okay. left him. Okay. Uh, I think uh, Professor Larry is there. He told me it's available. Yes, Lawrence. Uh, yes, here I am. Yes. <laughs> Uh -huh. You can speak, Professor Mike, with Larry. Okay. Okay. Well, uh, we're ready to move on to the next session there. So I'm just going to back off and uh, let Larry take over. Okay. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Mike. You did a great job on your session. Thank you, Larry. I appreciate that. Learned a lot. Uh, and I think it's a good segue into what we're going to be discussing now. Uh, the title of the session is Effective Tools and Strategies for Innovation, Creativity, uh, and entrepreneurship initiatives and programs. So um, in my, uh, my introductory my remarks here in the, in the short slide presentation I have, I'm gonna be talking about some very fundamental things that I think are really the underpinning for successful um, um, programs uh, and, and ecosystems. Um, so I'm going to see if we can get the, um, the slide shared. And have we done that? 